Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this webinar, which is the third in our series of webinars on the electric vehicle market. Uh, this one is focusing on how to deliver a successful EV project. Uh, I'm Claire King, and I'm a partner in uh, Freed's London office specialising in clean energy projects. Um, I'm joined today by a very distinguished panel who will be taking us through some practical case studies on EV projects, both from the fleet perspective and the charging infra infrastructure perspective. Uh, they are, if I can move my slides on, which I can't, that's bad. Uh, they are Simon uh, Rutledge, who is Group External Affairs and Sustainability Manager at BIFA, Nigel Morris, Tax Director at accountancy firm McIntyre Hudson, and Jenny Figueredo and Ben Bradley from the EV Charging Projects team at Oxfordshire County Council. Uh, before we get started, just a few points of housekeeping. If you have questions during the presentations, please type them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you have any issues on the tech side of things please use the chat function. Uh, after the event we'll be circulating a recording and a copy of the slides so please don't feel you need to take furious notes. If you missed our previous webinars you can access the recordings and slide decks from those on our website. You can either just search for Freeth's electric vehicles or uh, on the next slide we'll have a link. And also available on our website is our EV charging infrastructure risk matrix will you, which you will have heard us plug before Four, if you've joined our previous webinars. But in the meantime, let's get going. I'm going to start by giving you a very brief overview of the government funding available for EVs. Uh, not because this fits particularly well with the other topics, to be honest, but uh, simply because we get so many questions about it. Um, first, though, quickly an introduction to Freeths. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, we are a large full service law firm with offices all around the UK. We have both an energy sector group and a transport sector group, hence our interest in the EV market. Uh, listed there are some of the things that we advise on, um, but importantly at the bottom of the page is a link to our EV web page where you will find the materials from our previous webinars as well as the risk matrix. So quickly starting with um, funding available for electric vehicles themselves, um, the principal funding is the plug-in vehicle grant which is available to manufacturers and distributors of eligible plug-in vehicles and that's cars, vans, taxis and motorbikes. Um, on the OLEV website you will find a list of the vehicles that are eligible. Um, crucially it's claimed on new vehicles at first registration and it's deducted from the price of the vehicle at the point of sale by the dealership so as the customer there's nothing that you need to do in order to claim it. Um, importantly it's available both for private customers and businesses. Then on to the funding for charging infrastructure. Um, firstly, workplace charging. Uh, the workplace charging scheme, it's a, it's a voucher-based funding scheme of up to 75% uh, uh, towards the cost of purchasing and installing EV charge points at workplaces. It must be claimed against an approved charge point via an approved charge point installer authorised by OLEV. Uh, businesses, charities and public sector organisations are eligible, eligible provided that they meet the criteria listed there. The grant is capped at £350 per socket. That has recently been reduced from £500 as of April 2020 as the cost of charge points comes down. It's available for a maximum of 40 charge points across all sites for each applicant. So that's 40 per company regardless of how, of, of how many different sites you have. Hopefully that was increased from 20 out, out of April this year so that has gone up. Uh, if that's something you're looking at there's a link at the bottom of the page for further guidance where you can also uh, find out how to apply. Similarly there is a scheme available for home charging so uh, grant funding of up to 75% of the cost towards purchasing and installing charge points at domestic properties. Again it must be claimed against an approved charge point um, and in this instance it's claimed behalf of the customer by an approved installer. Again it's capped at £350 per socket um, and it's again capped at 40 across all sites. Uh, note here that it supports only smart charge points, that's as of summer last year, um, 
And again, for further guidance, you can look at the OLEV website link provided there. Finally, on charging infrastructure, there's the on-street residential charge point scheme, which is available to local authorities, again, for up to 75% of the cost of on-street EV charge point infrastructure to meet residential needs. Listed there are the, uh, the things that you can use the grant towards. Uh, although it's called on-street residential charge point scheme, it is actually also available for off-street public parking, um, provided that that, um, that services local residents 24-7. The fund is a £20 million fund um, and uh, there's a maximum of £6,500 available per charge point, um, but you don't necessarily get the full amount. You, of course, you have to demonstrate value for money in your application. Generally speaking, it's a total of 100,000 per project, um, but it can be more on a case by case basis. Um, for full guidance, see the link at the bottom of the page. And finally, for me, just a, a few other sources of funding for EV projects. Um, there's the Charging Infrastructure Investment Fund. This is a £400 million fund managed by Zook Capital and it invests in companies which own, provide, develop, construct or install public EV charging infrastructure. There's also the Rapid Charging Fund. Um, this hasn't actually been officially launched yet, but it will apparently fund rapid charging infrastructure at strategic sites across the road network, um, particularly where upgrading electrical connections is prohibitively expensive or uncommercial. Uh, finally on that list, there's the DEFRA Air Quality Grant Scheme. It's not specific to EVs, but, um, but clearly EVs have a role to play in improving air quality. So there could potentially be funding available from there. Um, there's also various research and development funding for new technologies. Um, in fact, the, there was quite a long list of these, so I haven't listed them all here, but, um, but among them is the Faraday Battery Challenge, looking at new battery technologies. Listed on the right hand side of the page are various tax incentives available for EVs, but I don't want to tread on Nigel's toes, so I won't go into, fur I won't go into further details now. At this point, I will hand over to our next speaker. Let me just stop sharing my screen. And I will hand over to Simon Rutledge of Biffa. Thanks, Simon. And could we have Simon's poll question, please? Right, sorry about the uh, slight delay there. Uh, uh, I shall uh, try again and get this up and running. Uh, okay, hopefully that's come through now and uh, people can uh, see my shared screen. Uh, just to introduce myself, I am not an expert on electric vehicles. I am a, a sustainability professional. So uh, my background is, 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 is absolutely in environmental uh, performance, environmental improvement, uh, environmental control and sustainability. Uh, what I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, this morning is uh, hopefully uh, the, the, the Biffa journey, uh, why we've done what we've done, uh, talk a little bit about a case study that involved uh, a couple of local authorities but focusing uh, pretty much in, in more depth on uh, one that uh, involved Manchester City Council. Uh, and talk about the partnering and trials. Uh, before, before ourselves, we've got over 100 years of uh, heritage and we've been uh, moving recyclers and waste materials around for, uh, uh, for, for, for over that period of time. Uh, we have, we've got approximately uh, 2,800 frontline vehicles uh, and they are, a lot of those are doing uh, heavy lifting. Uh, it's, it's, it's a heavy, heavy lifting uh, fleet. Uh, moving large volumes of materials throughout the UK uh, and we currently service around about 90%, 95% of UK 
uh, postcode coverage. So uh, that gives you an idea of the scale. We are UK based only though. So uh, just just a little bit of information about uh, about the journey we've been on. For the last uh, three years, we've been working on a new sustainability strategy. Uh, and part of that strategy is to, uh, is, we're split into three pillars there. The first part is building a circular economy, unlocking uh, investment in green economy infrastructure, uh, specifically with waste management. So that's, uh, that's what we're talking about there. The second pillar that we've, uh, we've got is tackling climate change. And we're committed to reducing 50% of our uh, CO2 equivalent emissions uh, by 2030 with a platform to achieve net zero beyond that uh, and with a, third with a third pillar of caring for our people and supporting our communities. But for the purposes of today, the really important thing is the second pillar, the tackling climate change and uh, our proposals to uh, uh, change the way people think about waste and change the way people think about the services we offer and deliver. So as part of that uh, second pillar, uh, this slide here talks in the highlights about uh, the 50% reduction in carbon emissions. We're looking to cease buying fossil uh, uh, fuel trucks uh, by 2030 and, and, and potentially have no further fossil fuel trucks uh, within the, the following 10 years after that. Now that's eight years, so that's a, a uh, nine years. So that's, that's, that's a reasonable challenge for uh, for a business and an industry which have very few of these bits of equipment in, uh, in, in common usage at the moment. Uh, the other things we can do are increasing our collection route efficiency, so utilising the vehicles that we have more efficiently, but uh, we already believe we've got the, the most efficient collection route density and uh, uh, we're, uh, we're keen to, uh, to strive to, to push that forward. So, uh, We'll, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about the, uh, the Manchester uh, uh, deployment. Uh, we're, we're basically, with, with that, looking to uh, save the local authority uh, uh, 900 tonnes of carbon per year, uh, carbon emissions associated with the diesel trucks. Uh, and uh, the capital investment of that has been funded by the authority. And we'll discuss uh, in a little bit more detail what, uh, what that means. Pictured there uh, out, outside uh, a particular uh, Manchester landmark uh, uh, is one of the, uh, the trial trucks that we had. And uh, I think it's probably important uh, to, uh, to skip on to, to talk about the trials and, uh, and how that helped us to deliver this as a successful uh, uh, case study. Before we talk about that, uh, as a business, we, we have a, a large uh, restored landfill uh, portfolio and uh, we have been exploring how we can utilize that uh, once the landform has stabilized. Uh, and we have, as part of our target, uh, targets and strategy, talked about uh, installing 50 megawatts of uh, solar, uh, solar photovoltaic, uh, putting that energy back into the, the, to the grid. Uh, as, as, as you all are very aware, uh, Electric vehicles are zero emissions at point of driving. They are not zero emissions. It depends on where the electricity comes from. So if you've got a bank of, uh, uh, of, of coal-fired power stations, uh, you, uh, you're not going to uh, reduce the overall emissions by uh, investing in uh, electric uh, vehicles. Uh, as we talked about there, 50 megawatts installed capacity by 2025. Again, not, not, uh, we're really challenging our engineering uh, partners uh, on, on those sorts of targets. So moving on to uh, the trial, which is probably what uh, most people are, are really quite interested about. Uh, we formulated, uh, as part of the early workings of the strategy formulation, we looked at formulating an alternative fuels working group. We, 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 we knew that we wanted to remove diesel and hydrocarbon based uh, fueled vehicles from our portfolio, uh, but uh, we, we very early recognized that uh, we needed to uh, pull experts together. They reviewed a variety of technologies and a variety of fuels and uh, from a variety of technology providers. So uh, uh, the, the, the picture there of the Manchester trial that was working with a, a local business called Electra uh, the, we were working with Deadney Signal, Scania, uh, Daimler, Mercedes-Benz, uh, and another uh, number of other op operators and providers of the, uh, the, the equipment. 
We selected Electra as a trial partner because uh, they are based in the Northwest uh, and they are, uh, they did have an actual vehicle we could drive. We were talking to a lot of uh, organizations and, uh, and they really didn't have the equipment. They had a lot of plans uh, in early part of formation. And, uh, uh, but what we wanted to do was really try the, uh, you know, trial, try the machine as it were. Uh, in Greater Manchester alone, air quality contributes uh, in, in their own uh, uh, research to an equivalent of 1,200 deaths a year, making it a really massive environmental risk to public health. Now, one of the things about this particular case study is uh, it's, it's all about timing, it's, uh, it's all about serendipity, it's all about the, uh, the alignment of the planets and the stars coming together uh, at the right time. Uh, in this particular instance, we were looking already to replace what was an aging diesel fleet, uh, which is why we started with the discussions about uh, replacing it with uh, uh, fully electric uh, uh, collection vehicles. So the trial vehicle was a 26 ton uh, re recycling uh, and refuse collection vehicle uh, fitted with a one and a half ton lithium ion battery uh, that provided that, that would collect uh, residual materials, refuse, dry mix recycling and organic waste collections. Uh, we ran the vehicle for, uh, for 18 months uh, on, the, uh, on the Manchester contract, uh, showing the vehicle actually doing the job uh, and testing it for nine months uh, in, intensely in a, in a number of scenarios, including motorway driving, urban stop start, uh, using lots of different drivers, uh, trying to prize the vehicle away from individual drivers once they'd had it, was uh, quite an achievement. Uh, but we looked at their own personal driving behavior and we had data from previous uh, driving uh, telematics systems as well. Uh, and we looked at different materials and payloads. We, date, uh, we collected data from both inbuilt telematics and the vehicle, uh, but observing as well, going out uh, with the crews and looking at it uh, and talking to them as well. Uh, the data collected includes start, finish, charge, number of tips, load, weight, charge rate per hour, driving behavior, and the number of bin lifts, which in our industry is absolutely crucial. Uh, we found from the trial that uh, uh, it performed better on the recycling rounds. They, uh, the recycling rounds tend to have lighter material. Uh, uh, the, the good people of Manchester uh, uh, predominantly do uh, uh, segregate their materials. They, they have a lighter weight material, so uh, it's cleaner, it's drier, uh, and that meant uh, you know, the, the, the loads on the vehicle were less. Uh, the, the slight material we had the most problem with was the organic matter, so the grass and the, the, uh, the, uh, the garden waste, which, uh, which to use a technical term in waste management is very claggy, and uh, getting it out of the bins when you're uh, un unloading them is, uh, is problematic. You need to lift the bin a number of times, you need to rattle it around uh, to get that material out. Uh, and for the trial, the distance to the organic waste recycling site was slightly longer. So that was the one we, we came closest to running out of charge, but still it didn't. Uh, and uh, operationally it did produce uh, extremely, op, uh, you know, extremely good feedback. Here's a couple of, uh, couple of three comments. Uh, what do I have to do to keep it, keep the vehicle, keep the trial vehicle? People wanted to make sure they were proud to be driving that electric vehicle. Uh, you need to slightly change your driving style, but the truck is very responsive and a pleasure to drive. Uh, it makes you uh, uh, much more careful and improved on your spatial awareness, which from a health and safety perspective and from a, an interaction with uh, the public perspective was really, uh, really positive from us. Uh, so we assessed the driving behavior and received that feedback. Uh, there was nervousness. We, uh, we talked about them in advance. There was different uh, range anxiety. Uh, so again, communicating back the, uh, the, the feedback from the trials have been very positive uh, and it is different to drive and you do have to adapt your driving, uh, driving, uh, driving methods. Uh, so, but it was exceedingly positive uh, uh, from, from the reviews. Just talking about the case study in a little bit more detail, uh, the Manchester trial is the first one listed on that slide. High density housing, city environment, that is exactly the sort of location where you would expect an electric uh, vehicle to, uh, to really uh, shine. Uh, on average, daily uh, uh, 7.17 hours operation, collecting on average 16 tonnes, approximately 1,100 lifts over 66 miles, 
uh, the battery consumption was uh, uh, approximately 70 uh, percent when it returned as i say less for the organic more for the uh, for the uh, for the recycling uh, and energy consumption costs were 14 percent of the, uh, the diesel equivalents we tried it as well in, a, in another one of our municipal areas uh, in, in in the thames valley uh, and uh, uh, the, the lifts the the, the the rounds were shorter there six, six hours 10 tons collected uh, and uh, probably half the number of lifts but over a longer distance so collection efficiency is not as great uh, but the battery consumption uh, because of that uh, because of the distance traveled uh, came back with only 20 percent charge left on it uh, and the energy consumption cost was 16 percent of the cost of diesel there so again it, uh, it really does cut down on costs of energy. Manchester uh, was setting the pace, uh, we're talking about uh, planets aligning, Manchester was setting the pace towards uh, uh, UK's zero carbon cities. Uh, they'd done a lot of work uh, with a project Scatter, working with a number of uh, organisations and identified what their carbon footprint was. Uh, they were adamant they wanted to remove and reduce that. Uh, they also declared a climate change emergency with the aim for zero carbon city uh, uh, by uh, 2038. So uh, they, they were going in the direction already. Uh, very important to get the client on board with these sorts of discussions. Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the measures Manchester were already putting in place did include a, a clean air zone charge, uh, which uh, would have led to a liability uh, on ourselves of around about 700,000 a year. So again, these, uh, these vehicles would, uh, would not uh, be subject to that, uh, that penalty. Uh, there are massive benefits of improving air quality. They are zero uh, uh, emissions at the point of the tailpipe, uh, as opposed to the diesels, which aren't. Uh, and once, if, if we manage to align the green electricity procurement up, uh, the actual carbon emissions were, would drop you. Uh, massively as well. As I say, we were already looking at de depot redevelopment and a fleet replacement, so all of that was already in, tr in, in train. So there was a massive opportunity to uh, invest to save. Uh, we did. Uh, we engaged energy consultants to come in and have a look at the the, uh, the sites. Uh, this is just one of the sites with uh, uh, once once the report was uh, was published uh, internally, which showed us where the point of connection was, the parking. That needs to rejig uh, the whole operation on the site. Uh, but again, we looked at a variety of uh, types of uh, charging equipment, uh, which would uh, allow us to, uh, to to overnight charge the vehicles, uh, you know, potentially with, uh, with, with uh, six or 4.5 hours of charging. Uh, and that led to this, uh, this announcement in July of, uh, of uh, the, the city replacing uh, half of its refuse collection lorries with pure electric models. So the uh, 27 which were due for replacement uh, uh, have now been ordered. We are expecting them uh, very soon. Uh, we've, we've got a program before Christmas of uh, three a week uh, over uh, November, December and uh, the end of next month. Uh, it's very clear that this does move uh, towards the, uh, the client zero carbon action plans. It aims to halve its direct carbon emissions uh, and make uh, move as one of the early steps to moving towards carbon zero by 2038. We, when we did the uh, modeling, the modeling was based on the current grid efficiency of, uh, of, of uh, electricity. So we were, we were very, uh, we were very uh, conservative when it came to that. Uh, so we didn't over promise, uh, but clearly with, uh, with developments in, uh, in the grid and uh, the greening of the grid, uh, this, this, you know, this, this has a massive impact going forward. Uh, there is a cost. Uh, nine points. Uh, that's just my reminder. I uh, do apologise. Let me uh, turn that off. Uh, there is a cost. Nine point seven five uh, million for the twenty seven vehicles. It is marginally more than if the existing trucks were replaced with uh, light for light diesel. Uh, however, the cost differential is almost certainly going to be overtaken by the cost in the fuel. And uh, interestingly enough, they were ordered from a, uh, uh, a Blackburn-based business, Electra, uh, which really did align with the uh, mayor's uh, stated game of, uh, of, of Northern Powerhouse, and uh, very important for, uh, for uh, the, uh, the the administrations in, uh, in in and around Manchester. So the future, clearly, that's the collection vehicles, and they do work. We will need to look at. Uh, 
uh, larger uh, uh, material, uh, larger vehicles that are different, and uh, uh, that's just a, a snapshot of some of them. Uh, you know, we've, we're already replacing our fleet vans with the Nissan ENV 200, 100% uh, electric van. Uh, that's uh, got 110 miles uh, capability. So the fitters can now go out and uh, and uh, and repair, make any repairs to any fleet. Uh, uh, but I have to say the Electron trial was absolutely fantastic and, uh, and, and and performed really well. Other manufacturers are coming to the uh, the piece now. Uh, that's a Dennis Eagle. Uh, Scania are, uh, are probably uh, not far off announcing their uh, their, their model, and uh, uh, certainly uh, Daimler Benz are, are, are uh, uh, within a year of, of putting a, a, a refuse collection vehicle on 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 the road. That's probably where I uh, I'll I'll leave it because that is my fifteen uh, just over fifteen minutes up, uh, Claire. Simon, a million points for being right on schedule. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, could we have the next poll question up, please? Um, and I will hand over to Nigel Morris of McIntyre Hudson. That's great. Uh, thank you, Claire. I'll just share my screen. So, um, so for those who've uh, who've never heard of uh, of, of McIntyre Hudson. Um, just to uh, just let you know, we are uh, an accountancy firm, um, heavily involved uh, with the uh, with the motor sector, uh, and therefore um, uh, we we do sort of uh, ever so lot in the sector and with fleets. Um, we are the UK uh, firm of uh, Baker Tilly, uh, so the global accountancy firm. Um, uh, so uh, we've got sort of lots of experience and lots of reach. Uh, both globally and uh, in Europe, and have been doing uh, a lot around uh, helping businesses to uh, green their company car fleet. So um, I'm just going to uh, try and, there we go, get the slides to move on. Um, just to uh, go through the, the current benefit and kind position, the new opportunities available around greening the company car fleet, um, some examples of the savings that are available as a consequence of that, some areas that perhaps you should consider, uh, a, a live case study and how we answered those areas for consideration and just to touch on uh, perhaps the future of, of, of an agile fleet policy. Um, I uh, understand obviously there's a, there's a from the, the rigid for the first poll there's a lots of uh, funders and installers so I'll uh, I'm not going to get it, go into the, the, the tax technical detail but just to give you an overview uh, and I think from uh, from the previous poll it was quite clear that uh, that cost and technological uh, availability are, are some of the some of the question marks um, and we, we kind of looked at those. Um, Claire very kindly covered uh, all of the kind of funding uh, and grants that are, that are available to support us greening the fleet and going to green cars so obviously I'm not going to cover that um, and uh, and obviously that that extends to other areas of taxation such as um, uh, vehicle excise duty breaks, uh, capital allowance breaks etc etc. I, uh, <clears throat> for myself, uh, I'm a director at McIntyre Hudson. I'm the motor tax and human capital head, uh, and uh, as I say, do uh, do a huge amount sort of in the in the motor sector uh, and with fleets uh, in order to um, to support uh, their fleet policy. So the current position, just just to quickly cover this off, um, company car taxation. Um, <clears throat> oh, sorry. Yeah, can you see that? Um, it's based on uh, the company car's list price and the CO2 rating. So uh, until April 2020, um, that was quite expensive and had been going up year on year for quite some time um, to the extent that a full electric company car was taxed at 16% of the list price. Uh, where that list price was sort of between 50 and 100,000 pounds, that was quite a lot of money. Um, and so people had, had started obviously to, to move away from company cars, move to cash or finding it very expensive. Um, from April 2020, uh, that benefit in kind uh, was slashed to 0% of this price. So quite a dramatic change. Um, and suddenly, uh, you know, electric vehicles and ultra electric vehicles which is what we're looking at. So those where there's electrification, so less than 50 grams of CO2 with some electric range, including full electric uh, vehicles. Um, suddenly became a very attractive benefit in kind for the driver. 
um, and uh, and this is this is around um, the tailpipe CO2, as we've said, not uh, not the overall CO2 of a vehicle, but the driving CO2 of a vehicle. Uh, and suddenly we had um, we had quite a dramatic change uh, that committed those full electric vehicles to zero percent of BIK for this year, uh, to one percent for the next tax year, to two percent for the tax year after that. Uh, and there's been a statement committing that to two percent for the following two years. Um, we are really hoping that uh, that nothing happens in the budget uh, later on this year, probably sort of November time, uh, to uh, to impact that. But uh, that that's where we are at the moment. So a very low basis of taxation for zero emission cars and also for ultra low emission vehicles. Um, hence helping ve helping fleets to green their fleet. Um, so salary sacrifice. So salary sacrifice has been around for a long time in relation to cars. Probably the first salary sacrifice I was involved in was about 13 years ago. Ironically, that was for one of the uh, for one of the Russell Group universities who saw this as an added value benefit. So something where we can benefit the uh, employees who don't have a company car, as well as um, perhaps people who take cash and, and enticing them back into a company car, and then maybe thinking about sort of the actual business need drivers. Uh, and whether we, we incorporate that as our full policy. Salary sacrifice being attractive because we have lots of upfront tax and national insurance savings, uh, and then uh, we end up with um, uh, the ability to sort of uh, better fund uh, the vehicles uh, in, in a more cost-effective way for the driver and for the employer, uh, and, uh, and, and take tax breaks. Um, the salary sacrifice arrangements were impacted in 2017 by a new piece of legislation that said any vehicle above 75 grams of CO2, um, we have an additional benefit in kind on the difference between the, the salary that was foregone where tax and IC was saved and the benefit in kind. So if you've got a, a salary foregone of 500 pounds a month for a vehicle that had got a benefit in kind of 350 pounds a month, they brought in an extra tax on the 150 pound gap for vehicles above 75 grams of CO2. That legislation still exists, but of course, we're looking at very ultra low emission vehicles now with, with lower benefit in kind tax from the changes in April 2020, and they're all sub 50 grams of CO2. So salary sacrifice is therefore uh, back on the agenda as, a, as an efficient way to uh, green the fleet and provide company cars, um, as well as build the tie into CSR, um, health and safety, obviously, as people sort of come out of cars and take cash, that becomes risky. Um, and, and actually just, just incorporating a better employee remuneration package. So great, new opportunity. And here's some potential, some savings. If we've got somebody who's got the choice of a salary of £25,000 and then they go lease a car themselves, or taking a lower salary of £19,000 and being provided with that car, and in this example, that's a Nissan Leaf, then you can see the individual has got sort of a net cost to them of £340 a month, but in, in net, net terms, they're saving almost £100 a month. And the company is, is, uh, employer is saving um, over £2,000 a year in relation to uh, the overall salary costs, uh, even by providing the car. So some potentially very uh, significant saving opportunities uh, through salary sacrifice and greening the fleet. Um, but it's uh, a bit of a policy decision as to know what to do. You know, which employees do we include? Do we just look at those with no entitlement, those that have opted out and taken the cash, or do we look at all company car drivers as well? Which vehicles do we look at? Um, and helpfully, um, in, in, over, over the last couple of years, we, we've had a lot more vehicles um, coming to the market. Um, clearly, there's, there's some that, that, that are announced and yet to come. But instead of, you know, we haven't just got a Leaf or a Tesla, you know, we've got lots of, of product in between, um, either in market or coming to market, you know, from, from people like sort of Porsche and Mazda and Ford um, and, you know, all sorts, Volvo, Polestar, all sorts of, 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 of our traditional manufacturers, as well as perhaps some new entrants from, from India and China. But um, so it's a case to say that, you know, there, there's a lot more choice in terms of, of lifestyle and practical vehicles um, that where we can green the fleet. Um, but where do we charge? And this is, this is the quandary and something obviously that some of these examples, um, <clears throat> excuse me, both from Biffa uh, and, and, uh, and, and the next presenters will, will cover off. 
is, um, you know, where do we charge that vehicle? We can see some of the tax breaks in relation to sort of home charges um, or charges at work. Um, but also, you know, what can we do about the public charging infrastructure? Um, there are lots of cost implications and, and network implications, of course. You know, we've got to source this energy for these charges. Uh, and that isn't uh, always that easy. Um, and so, uh, so there's, there's a, a, a lot of challenges um, where there's a lot of innovation being put into the marketplace, uh, lots of, of, of new businesses coming to the market in relation to the innovation on provision of energy, provision of charges, prop charge points, wireless charging points, um, you know, the whole, the whole infrastructure, the whole ecosystem, apps to support living with these vehicles. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot that is happening um, and therefore quite a bit for the, for the fleet decision maker and the company car drivers to think about when it comes to um, what, what we're going to do. So what are people doing? Well, here's a case study. This is a real live business. This is one where the, uh, the, the vehicles are, are starting to be delivered. Um, this is a, an organisation that was fortunately um, unaffected by COVID-19. Um, their business has, uh, has, has, has done very well still through, through lockdown, um, which is great for them. Um, but they have been a business that's been expanding rapidly over the last 10 years. They're still expanding greatly. Um, and they're keen to promote their, uh, their CSR. You know, they're doing lots of work with some major private and public sector organisations. And they want to make sure that they credentialise themselves from a corporate social responsibility perspective uh, and, and obviously a, a provide attractive benefit in kind to their senior employees uh, and, and therefore greening the fleet uh, ticks a few boxes. Um, they're very fortunate, they're looking to order, well they've ordered uh, and about to receive delivery, um, certainly of the Tesla models, the Porsches uh, will be a little bit longer before they arrive, but four Porsche Taycans and two Teslas um, is, uh, is, is, is going to be a very attractive sort of fleet when they're, when they're parked outside the vehicle. Um, but they've had some things to think about, you know, navigating through the cost to employees um, because predominantly, you know, the point of entry is, is still um, high compared to traditional fleet policies. So a traditional fleet policy is based on a hierarchy um, and clearly, you know, there, there, there are caps and limits in relation to the, um, the amounts that, that people are allowed to have as a, as a monthly lease cost, for example, and EVs tend to, to be at the upper end or above that. But salary sacrifice can help to deal with that because the actual overall cost, um, but at the point of salary sacrifice anyway, is, is lower. But, he, but the total cost of ownership as well is, uh, is, is very attractive, for a, certainly for full electric vehicles. Um, so what's the cost of the business? So they've had to sort of consider, well, what, you know, what, what do we give the car or do we help people to support to lease these vehicles privately? So do we go for car or do we go for cash? Um, and they're going for the car. That's fine. So, uh, so that works for them. Um, and what method do we procure these? You know, there are significant tax breaks for a corporate if they buy a full electric vehicle with upfront capital allowances. Um, but there's perhaps, you know, still a question mark over the risk of residual value. Um, whereas the leasing company could, could take some of that risk uh, and, uh, and their certainty for the corporate in terms of what it costs them. So they're going to lease them. Um, how do we charge them? Um, and, and what's the education around charging? Um, it's interesting, you know, lots of people initially when they look at electric vehicles get quite concerned about how, how long and what capacity and what energy is required to fully charge that vehicle. Um, yet when I, when I go out onto the driveway and I'm going to do a business journey, I don't sit in my diesel car and look at it and go, crikey, I can't start because I've got a full tank of fuel. Um, and there was quite a, a big differential where you're charging a vehicle from, say, 20% to 80% charge. Um, you know, probably takes as long to do that 20 to 80 percent charge as it would do to do from 80 to 100 percent. So there's a, a lot of education to be thought about and, and route planning and planning of people's lifestyles around living with this, these vehicles. And so they looked at that and said, well, you know, what does it take to get to that 80 percent charge? Uh, yet tick that works for us. Now, where do we charge them? What do we do about chargers? You know, do we put six really high voltage chargers outside our office? Um, or do we think about the fact that um, that could have quite an impact on the grid? Uh, that could have quite an impact on our costs. Uh, our, our DNO might, might ask us to, uh, to stump up a lot of money for that, whereas perhaps we could have a couple outside because we'll put home chargers in uh, and people do the bulk of their charging at home. 
which is, uh, which is very efficient and, and use of smart meters, etc. Um, and it spreads obviously the, the, the demand on the grid. Um, they, they, they did look at it and, and their senior executives didn't all live in the same street. So, uh, so there was a, a, a spread of, of impact on the grid uh, and, and therefore uh, better access to capacity for the charging. So they're predominantly going to go for home chargers, um, but they're also going to have some chargers actually at their offices as well. Um, and then how do they supply that? Who, who do they talk to? Um, they've talked to a, to a number of, of, of organisations, some, some household names in the sector, in, who, who perhaps sit there as a sort of a broker. Um, they've also looked at, do they procure them themselves? Do they use leasing providers? And settled on, a, on a, a, an established leasing provider with a, uh, with a growing um, focus on uh, zero emission vehicles uh, and, and corporate social responsibility. Um, uh, and, and obviously, you know, the ability to sort of access the advice from advisors like ourselves to give that complete package to the client. Um, so you've got the, the lease company who knows what they're doing. They, they can deal with the sort of the metal and the maintenance and so on and so forth, but also the advice around salary sacrifice and how that works. So, um, so some live things to be thinking about. And just to finish, um, you know, this has started people to think about, well, what does fleet policy therefore look like? Um, you know, on the one extreme, we sort of cash out and let people do their own thing. On the other extreme, we have company car, but we make that green. And then in the middle, we've got this flexibility, perhaps using total cost of ownership and salary sacrifice to think about how we deal with sort of people trading up and trading down um, and, and, you know, maximise the efficiency of the fleet. So, uh, so quite a lot of, of, of opportunity there. Um, and we just wanted to give a live example of greening the car fleet, some of the considerations which I think will be useful for you um, when you're thinking about your go-to-market um, and, uh, and also um, in relation to, sorry, it's my timer, uh, and in relation to, uh, to, to the funding uh, aspects. Um, so, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was me. Uh, thank you for listening. And um, I'll, uh, I'll hand back over to Claire. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, could we have the next poll question, please? And just quickly before I hand over to our next speakers, um, we've had a, a few questions around um, whether the slides will be available. And the answer is yes, we are recording the session um, and we will be circulating a link to the recording along with the slide deck to everybody who registered. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand over to uh, Jenny Figueredo and Ben Bradley from Oxfordshire County Council. All right, good morning. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, Park and Charge, which is an electric vehicle charging solution aimed to provide residents in Oxfordshire without off street parking a convenient, cheap place to charge their vehicle whilst increasing general electric charging provision throughout the county. So we work for Innovation Hub, which developed from an entity within Oxfordshire County Council to a unit in its own right. Uh, and the iHub has been key in developing links with business and academia, as well as securing external funding for projects for the county. We're working with many partners who are driving disruptive technologies, and the iHub delivers new solutions in different spheres, such as public health, green energy, autonomous vehicles, and electric vehicles for Oxfordshire and beyond. Uh, we are constantly looking at new ways to collaborate on research projects, and we're well-placed to innovate in this way, having access to great universities, and technology clusters. So Jenny and I are part of an EV integration team and we're a team of five and as well as working on Park and Charge which is the focus of this presentation we're also working on other electric vehicle projects around vehicle to grid, on-street charging solutions and bringing the five districts in Oxfordshire together to create a county-wide EV charging strategy. Uh, so Oxfordshire is ahead of the UK average in terms of uptake of electric vehicles Key contributing factors are the affluence of the area, the high level of education, and a significant level of environmental awareness within the political sphere in Oxfordshire County Council and the district councils pushing the green agenda. So although this graph is a forecast, which could be impacted by policy changes and COVID, we know that over the last year where the automotive industry as a whole has taken a severe hit, uh, battery electric vehicle sales have been very resilient. Uh, and data from the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders showed that to date, comparing 2019 to 2020, there's been a 44% fall in petrol vehicle sales, a 60% fall in diesel, 
and 157% increase in battery electric vehicle sales across the UK, showing a real appetite for EVs. This graphic uh, shows the distribution of battery electric vehicle sales as a percentage of new vehicles throughout the UK provided by the uh, Department of Transport, with London and South East significantly higher than the rest of the UK and highlighting the need for an increased rate of electric vehicle charging provision in these areas. It's, uh, it's well known that a lack of off-street parking at homes is a barrier to EV adoption. And in Oxfordshire, 30 to 40% of homes do not have access to off-street charging. And although on-street charging is maybe part of the solution, uh, it has multiple drawbacks, including uh, local disruption during installation, it adds to general clutter with excessive street furniture and congestion and leads to conflict with other car owners. And in order to tackle these issues, we're piloting a different solution. Uh, and a solution to combat the lack of off-street parking as a barrier to EV adoption, we believe is the park and charge concept. And the idea is to create EV charging hubs in suitably located car parks in cities, towns and villages for residents without off-road parking at their homes. This is one of those ideas which is a bit of a light bulb moment. Uh, as a colleague of ours, we were walking around areas with very little off-street parking and noticed how there was often public or council-owned car park very close by. So we engaged in a feasibility study, assessing the appetite for this solution in target areas. And following this study, along with our project partners, we were awarded funding by Innovate UK to pilot the solution over an 18-month period. And the aim is to deliver up to 300 charge points across 30 car parks. And part of the feasibility study was to assess the demand, the practicality and costs for park and charge and help to make the case for this as an effective solution. Uh, I'll now pass you over to Jenny to talk about how we're delivering the solution, who our project partners are and what we're trying to deliver for our residents. Thank you very much, Ben. I hope you can all hear me okay. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenny Figueredo. Um, Ben's still going to be driving the slides for me, but um, here we go. Thanks for handing on the baton. So here's our five um, key park and charge partners on the screen here. It's a mix of private, public sector and academia, as you can see. Each of us bringing an essential element of expertise to the project um, and all working together harmoniously to deliver this um, for the public good. So we've got D Zeta Specialist Lighting, who are the lead partner. They're a BISTA based SME and they're um, leading on bringing the charging equipment to the market. So they're providing the innovative charging infrastructure um, as well as managing all of us. Um, UI UK, Urban Integrated on the right hand side there are an innovative software and consulting company you might have heard of. They will be providing the electric mobility service provider platform and the app that will integrate with Zeta's chargers, uh, enabling EV charger reservation. Um, data integration, payment integration, and uh, a dashboard to report back to um, project partners. Bottom right there, we've got SSE Utility Solutions, so a well-known brand there who are a leading UK installer and operator of EV charging infrastructure. Their role is being responsible for the de development of the um, business model, as well as implementing the electrical supply infrastructure, which will serve um, the charge points in the scheme. University of Oxford in the bottom left here, they are doing some research uh, and providing insights onto revenue streams, helping us to identify the market potential in terms of geographic and social demographic market segments. Um, and we'll also be disseminating uh, the results of the pilot, which is just yet to start. So we're doing a bit of a case study here on something that we're in the middle of. Um, and last but not least, we've got Oxfordshire County Council, which is ourselves. So we're the lead local authority partner, um, coordinating four of the um, local authority districts uh, within Oxfordshire's two tier system. So Cherwell District Council, the Vale of the White Horse, South Oxfordshire and West Oxfordshire. Those are the local authorities that are providing the car parks. Um, so we're working with them to help resolve some of the ownership and procurement issues associated with these, um, as well as looking at some um, county council owned car parks in part of the scheme and also leading on the communications and dissemination uh, fun side of things to residents. Um, so although we all have slightly different reasons for wanting to take part in the project or investing in slightly different ways, we very much keep our shared goals for the project in mind at all times, which as Ben has outlined are providing a much needed charging option for residents who don't have off street parking. 
greatly enhancing the local provision um, that we currently have in Oxfordshire of user-friendly and convenient EV charging, supporting and encouraging generally that shift uh, in Oxfordshire from petrol and diesel vehicles to electric vehicles, and hopefully um, modelling a scheme that can be successfully rolled out in other local authority areas across the UK. Next slide, please, Ben. Um, so what are residents actually getting with the park and charge scheme? We're actually trying to replicate as much as possible the benefits of home charging that, um, that many of us already uh, benefit from. So discounted overnight rates for charging, easy access and also a bookable um, system so that they can have assurance that people can park overnight and charge their cars when they need to. Um, so no doubt that you'll be able to get that charge for your electric vehicle that you desperately need. Um, the chargers themselves, um, may or may not look like that image on the right, but they will be three phase fast chargers, seven to 22 kilowatts, which means the rate at which cars can charge will be flexible and can adapt to the demand of the grid capacity at the time. Um, so that's really useful in Oxfordshire, which is an area where the grid is currently quite constrained. Uh, another aspect of the project is obviously part providing general EV charging um, and because it's a variable rate we can give someone who needs a very fast charge um, that fast charge um, as well as allowing slower charging overnight um, at a cheaper rate to residents. We want these charges very much to be visible. I think we believe if you can see them there, it helps um, overcome that barrier that you're not sure you're going to be able to get a charge when you need one. So these will be really prominent in the car parks they're going into and help to um, hammer home that message that EVs are becoming the norm and help people get a good mental map of where they can charge up. Um, on the screen there, you've got a screenshot of what the app might look like. So showing you uh, the bookability and the fact that we can communicate with residents about what's available when. And the top right is an idea of the dashboard that we as, as project partners and local authorities will be able to see, which will really help us understand um, which charges are um, out of service, for example, and leap on those quickly. How, much, how the charges are being used by who and when, and also give us an idea of the uh, percentage of green energy in the grid at any one time. Uh, next slide, please, Ben. So in terms of the contract model itself, the ownership for this park and charge is actually quite different from a normal local authority procurement model. Um, the local authority in this case is acting as hosts to the EV charging equipment. And in actual fact, because this is Innovate funded, um, we are having this uh, for free, which is fantastic. Um, there's going to be two different contractual arrangements. So a land lease arranged uh, arrangement is granted with the local authority to allow a subsurface operator, in this case SSE, the right to provide that electrical energy, data, energy and data um, communication supply to each of the locations for a 10 year period. And then there'll be a separate concession contract in place with the charge point operator, in this case Easy Charge, which is a kind of new name for Zeta's uh, EV charging delivery arm, uh, and they then provide the service to the consumer. Uh, they own the equipment um, and they operate it, therefore taking the profits and also um, carrying the risk. That contract would be slightly shorter, um, five years with a sort of three or five year extension possibility. And that model we think will allow scalability in that the underground infrastructure can be laid uh, in advance, providing large capacity um, with the flexibility to add charges on as and when required um, and minimizing the expense because obviously the, the underground infrastructure can often be the biggest part of the uh, expense of putting these charges in. Um, and having a shorter CPO contract um, for a large amount of charges means that there'll be the flexibility to upgrade to new technologies and um, an upgrade earlier, which will of course provide uh, a better service to our residents. So all in all, we think this model will be great, greater flexibility, value for money and allow scalability than uh, the normal off the peg model. Uh, next slide, aware of time, have to whiz through a few of these. So you might be wondering how we're deciding where to put our charging hubs. There's hundreds of car parks in Oxfordshire that we could choose. So we've developed um, with EMU um, a geospatial tool to help us identify uh, which park car parks are most viable. Part of that is to do with how they're owned. Um, obviously the ones we fully own ourselves and don't have to go across any third party land are more viable. Um, ones that are available 24 hours. The electricity supply and capacity there is obviously crucial because that's a, um, having to improve that is a huge expense. And the main thing is um, that the population within five minutes um, of that car park is one that we think will adopt electric vehicles. So a large population area that own a lot of cars and um, are unlikely to have off street parking as well as potentially being early adopters for the reasons we've described. Um, 
we are, uh, in terms of timeline, haven't put any charges in the ground yet, but we will be um, having a pilot within a pilot. So installing a, a car park in Vista in January, and then seeing how that goes for a few months before we roll out the rest of the charges in the 30 remaining car parks um, over next summer. Um, we'd love to come back and talk to you about how that's gone uh, nearer the time. Next slide, please. So um, not much point putting these charges in if we're not going to tell people about them. So we've, we've put quite a chunk of our project budget towards communications and education. Um, and we'll be delivering a comms campaign, an education campaign over the next year or so, as well as raising awareness of the facilities and, and encouraging their use. It will be a general um, campaign to encourage and educate on electric vehicles. So working with other schemes in the area to just really uh, motivate people to make that change. Um, you might recognize some of the experts we're working on here. So Urban Foresight helped deliver Go Ultra Low uh, Dundee and Green TV who uh, launched World EV Day which happened last week and also run the Oxford EV Summit and um, an EV show. So working with some great experts in the field here, we'll be delivering a digital campaign on social media, um, a website which is coming soon, uh, lots of live events hopefully so people can experience an EV and give them a test drive because we know that makes a huge amount of difference to their um, keenness to participate uh, and we'll do uh, online if needed um, because of Covid and then we'll have traditional PR um, and hopefully a radio partnership as well and also looking to recruit some EV champions so that local people can help inspire their neighbours um, and, uh, and educate them as well on the, the benefits of EVs. Next slide, please, Ben. Um, so as I said, we, I know this webinar is about case studies of successful projects. We're midway through ours, um, but we can already see uh, some of the barriers and issues that we've had to face so far. Um, and I'll talk about some of the critical success factors as well. Uh, one obvious thing is with an innovation project, we're doing new things. Uh, so if you haven't done them before, there's always unseen complications and things can take a little bit longer. So we found that with the contracts, um, our CPO contract and land lease are taking a little bit longer than we would have liked and a bit complicated, but we've got some great support from district council legal teams um, and we're working through things like how um, uh, how we're going to um, the booking scheme and the payment scheme and enforcement is actually going to um, work with different district council uh, ways of working because each of the four districts actually has a completely different scheme that we need to interact with. Um, we anticipate there'll be different perceptions of the car park uh, schemes. Uh, there might be some fear of missing out going on if um, a certain area doesn't have uh, car parks as uh, charges in part of the scheme, whereas others um, not too keen on EVs might perceive that we've got too many in too soon. Um, but as Ben's described, we've got justifications for these. We know that um, the, the EV uptake in Oxfordshire is going to skyrocket in the next couple of years. And we've thought very carefully about where's the best place to put these charges. Um, like any project that's delivering at the minute, there's all sorts of unforeseen COVID things. Um, we think people might be driving less into the town centres where these are. But we also know that people will be using public transport less and using cars more. So how that runs out, we'll just have to play out. Um, and last slide, I think, Ben. Um, some of the key success factors are typical for any project. So making sure your um, stakeholders are all uh, working together nicely and know about the project and know about everything in the timescale that they really need to um, really helps with effective partnership working. We found the local knowledge from working closely with the districts has been invaluable. Um, what might have looked like a promising car park simply won't work if there's a market on every Saturday. Um, and of course, understanding our audience and what their genuine concerns and, and perceptions of a scheme like this is really important. So we're launching a Oxfordshire wide survey just this week to really understand those key audiences um, and of course like I said linking up with other initiatives so we're not working in an isolation bubble and saying this is the only solution is important to us and making sure that our funders are fully engaged and really happy um, with with the program as it goes along is really important to us and that's all we've got time for um, we don't have a project website yet but we will um, if you google park and charge in the next few months you'll find one and that's our contact details if you've got any questions at all for myself or Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben and Jenny. Um, a slight technical hitch on our side. We put uh, the wrong poll question up previously. So here is um, Jenny and Ben's poll question, if you would kindly uh, answer that one. Um, just to just a reminder, we will be circulating a recording of this session and the slides after the event. You should receive an automated email in the next couple of days. Um, and I will just share my screen 
quickly. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so we do have one more uh, webinar in this EV series coming up. It's likely to be in November and the subject is likely to be low emission vehicle technologies, what you need to know. So if that's of interest, please do register for that one. If you're not already on the mailing list, please drop me an email. My email address is there and we will happily add you. Um, the EV series is actually part of a wider Green Breakfast webinar um, series. It used to be a physical seminar, but no longer. Previously, we provided breakfast, but it's now BYO. Um, the, the Green Breakfast series will continue um, and the next topics are likely to be um, hydrogen as a fuel and also large scale battery storage. So again, if those are of interest, please do sign up um, and we look forward to seeing you there. Um, just a final thank you to our speakers, uh, Simon, Nigel, Jenny and Ben. Um, we've had a number of questions come through. We probably don't have time to cover them now. So what we will do is, is bring those together in a document that we will also circulate with the recording and the slides. So thank you very much to everybody for attending and hope to see you at the next one.